first lecture, I'll talk mostly, will be mostly a review of SYK. First, I make some general remarks, and then it will be a review of SYK. The second lecture will be a review of ADS2. And finally, the third lecture will be uh, traversable wormholes and uh, things related to that. Um, OK, so I titled this series of talks uh, Toy Models for a Black Hole. And um, so depending on the aspect of black hole physics that uh, you want to look at, you might approximate the black hole in different ways. So for example, if uh, you are interested in the gravitational radiation emitted by a pair of, rot of black holes orbiting each other, you can uh, replace to a good approximation those black holes by point, point masses and then calculate the gravitational radiation from those point masses. And that approximation works well for some, some cases. Um, of course, uh, the kind of toy models we are talking about are models that uh, attempt to capture other features of black holes. So we like uh, to capture the quantum effects of black holes, uh, the fact that uh, the, they have a temperature and entropy. Uh, we like to describe how uh, objects that fall into a black hole are thermalized. Um, and that involves understanding why we have apparent information loss. So we want that black holes have apparent information loss. Uh, but we also want them uh, to be perfectly unitary, at least as uh, seen from the outside. And one wants to reconcile uh, those two things together. Um, and this subject of uh, reconciling these two things together, it's a familiar sort of sub subject uh, in mesoscopic physics of trying to understand systems which are sort of um, large enough that thermodynamics uh, might be applicable, but small enough that you can still ask about exact unitarity in the dyna dynamics. And uh, black holes, in some ways, uh, as, at least as seen from the outside, are, fall within this type of systems. And we like to understand various issues uh, related uh, to this. And these issues are not particular to black holes, but they also, similar questions arise in other systems. We saw an example of this in the discussion of chaos and the near horizon dynamics, that is uh, the topic of uh, Douglas's lectures, for example. Um, eventually, we'd like to have uh, our models might get more and more sophisticated until we get uh, to have models that have local physics uh, near the horizon with Einstein gravity. And one of the goals of all of this is, of course, to understand the interior and the singularity. And the singularity inside the black hole is a bit like a big crunch. And uh, of course, understanding that uh, presumably uh, will help us understand the Big Bang. So if we understand, for example, the singularities uh, within the thermophile double, so let's say we have the diagram of the eternal, let's say, Schwarzschild black hole. Um, so here, in the interior region, both the past and the futures, we have a Big Bang and a Big Crunch. They are anisotropic, but they are uh, similar to the Big Bang and Big Crunch. And we like to definitely understand them. So, um, and that's part of the reason we pay attention to this geometry, is that if we understand this geometry well enough, for example, we eventually should be able to understand what goes on at uh, the singularities. And we should always keep in mind that the, the biggest question in quantum gravity is to understand the Big Bang. And uh, of course, it would be nice to understand it directly, uh, but it uh, seems very confusing. And any idea that we have from black holes, we should always ask, uh, well, how could it transfer to the problem of the Big Bang? And well, I won't offer you any answers for this for now. Um, but why are black holes simpler? So one of the reasons uh, black holes simpler are simpler is that if you have a black hole, you can stand very far away from the black hole, and then the fluctuations of space-time are suppressed, and you have a solid platform in which uh, you can ask questions. So at long distances, the fluctuations of gravity are small, and you can use uh, that to define an S-matrix or to define uh, boundary correlators and so on. And in that way, you can uh, pose questions which you can try to answer. Um, of course, uh, depending on what you want to discuss, you have different models. So one uh, possible model, some system with high entropy could be just a gas of uh, weakly interacting particles. Uh, the entropy is large. Uh, but we don't think that uh, such a system has a dual, which is Einstein gravity. It might be Vassiliev gravity, perhaps. Um, another thing we would like to understand is uh, the um, 
the symmetries of the near horizon region. So we talked, uh, we heard uh, many speakers uh, remark on uh, the tra time translation symmetry at infinity uh, becomes a boost symmetry in the near horizon region. And understanding that uh, leads to uh, many interesting questions. Uh, but we uh, and notice that uh, this, uh, this symmetry is uh, an exact, so in, if, uh, in the descriptions we have of this system using gauge gravity duality, which involve uh, using the thermofield double, as you have seen in some other talks, uh, this is an exact symmetry. So at least around this point, we have this as an exact symmetry. And the system on the boundary, so even in the case where we don't have flat space, but we have, let's say, uh, some, uh, could be a dual to some quantum mechanical system on the boundary. Um, even in that case, where we have no relativistic symmetry in the boundary, we do have this uh, boost symmetry in the interior. And that's related to the uh, symmetries generated by the modular Hamiltonian when we have two entangled states. And so that's, uh, in this situation, is supposed, that's supposed to be an exact symmetry. Um, we also have uh, approximate symmetries, which uh, shift us uh, up and down and left and right in this diagram. And it's uh, interesting to try to understand those symmetries. And I think one of the interest is, interest in the SYK model will be that it uh, offers us some opportunity to understand uh, those symmetries. OK, so that uh, was the end of the introduction. And when uh, we are talking about thermal effects of black holes, um, I thought uh, we should uh, remark on the fact that while well, we, we expect black holes emit uh, thermal radiation, and for astrophysical black holes, this is a small effect. But for uh, small enough black holes, you could actually see this with your own eyes. I mean, it could emit radiation which looks like white light. And I thought I would show you a little model of how that black hole would look like. So do you have any guesses? So I have a box here with a black hole that, um, <laughs> no, it's not really a black hole, but it emits uh, white light. Um, so I'm, I'm going to turn off, we are going to turn off the lights and you should uh, look at the box and, <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll see, maybe I'll open the box or you will tell me what you expect. Uh, have you imagined what to expect? How much light does such a black hole emit? A black hole that emits has a temperature set, let's say, like the temperature of the surface of the sun. Do you expect a big firewall? Do you expect uh, <laughs> How much light do you expect to see? Please turn off the lights. Can anyone see it? Maybe you can turn down off your, your, the guys who have iPads, maybe you can turn them over. <laughs> can can any, any other than me see? see? Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. You can turn them on, on again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We, we, we'll need lots of these black holes to, for this to work. Now, uh, exercise. Calculate the mass of a black hole like this, whether I could have lifted up like I, I did this box. <laughs> That's exercise number one. And second is that even if I could have lifted up, where well, you would have survived it, <laughs> uh, sitting at that distance. Um, OK, good. So that was, that's the end of the entertainment section of the talk. OK, motivations for, uh, so we're going to be talking about the uh, SYK model. Um, the name stands for Sashdev, Ye, and Kitayev. Um, so the model was introduced, a variant of this model was introduced by Sashdev and Ye in uh, the 1990s. And a couple of years ago, Kitayev uh, simplified the model and pointed out some, some of uh, its, its interesting uh, features, uh, which uh, we'll see now, I'll uh, review in this lecture. Uh, so why it is uh, interesting? Well, first, uh, it is uh, solvable in the large n limit, solvable at uh, n uh, very large. So that's one reason to study it. Uh, the second is that it's a model uh, which, in which you can see thermalization. Uh, 
and quantum chaos uh, in the context of a solvable model. So that's uh, very nice. Um, solvable model with chaos. Um, now, you, you, might, you might think, do we have another example of a solvable model that displays some form of chaos? And na naively, you would think that uh, chaos and non-solvability are, and solvability are incompatible. But one simple, mo one simple uh, model is to consider the motion of a particle in hyperbolic space. So if you have a particle that is moving in two-dimensional, let's say a non-relativistic particle moving in two-dimensional hyperbolic space, uh, the trajectories of this particle diverge due to the geometry of hyperbolic space. And so it's somehow a chaos that is governed by geometry. Um, now you might complain and say that that's a system with an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Uh, okay, so you could take that uh, motion and put, put it in a very big Riemann surface of very high genus. So you'll have the motion in hyperbolic space for quite a while. So you have that initial chaos and then you'll have uh, something else, okay? Uh, well, you continue to have chaos, but not exactly in an in in ex in exactly solvable model, but the model would be solvable for a little while. And that uh, is the kind of model that SYK is. So it's solvable for a little while. And part of the theme of the lectures is to uh, show that indeed the, mo the, the kind of chaos that we get is somewhat similar to, in some sense, the motion of, uh, in, of a particle in hyperbolic space. This will be, end up being the motion of a particle in ADS2 space. And the ADS2 space is something that emerges from the dynamics of the original model that is not put in by hand. So that's uh, one of the interesting aspects. The other is related to the diagram that uh, we saw here. It's a model that incorporates a little bit the symmetries of the near horizon geometry beyond the, the boost symmetry. And that's uh, also interesting. And it has a dynamics which is similar to the dynamics of uh, near extremal black holes. So extremal uh, black holes arise when you have a black hole that carries a conserved charge, let's say electric charge, could be angular momentum also, and then you consider lowest possible mass with that charge, and those black holes have a zero temperature, and they develop uh, a scaling symmetry, and that man is manifested in an ADS2 geometry. And um, they appear, but on the other hand, the black hole has a finite number of degrees of freedom, so we are uh, seeing the appearance of an approximate uh, scaling symmetry uh, in the context of a symmetry with a finite number of degrees of freedom. And that's uh, the pattern of symmetries that we get for that case, for ADS2, will actually uh, be the same as the one we have for SYK. And that will be, I mean, describing that in more detail will be the subject of the second lecture. OK, good. So that's the motivation. Now, I like to. Uh, say a few words about where SYK sits in the uh, space of Larsen theories. Uh, so if we have Larsen models, uh, large n, um, the simplest Larsen models are the O-N vector models. So these are models where the uh, basic variable is uh, uh, field phi with an index uh, i that goes from 1 to n, and with O n invariant uh, interactions. So an example would be a phi 4 theory, where we have d phi squared plus uh, phi squared squared, for example, with some coupling constant. So that's uh, an example. The Larsen limit of the Wilson-Fisher uh, fixed point, for example, you can get it from a model like this. Now, in these models, the anomalous dimension uh, is uh, or the strength of interactions in some sense is small. It's, it's a further one over n. These are the dimensions of the operators which have spin bigger than two that couple like the graviton, like the stress tensor. Uh, and the gravity dual um, for these models uh, is uh, not Einstein gravity, but it might be some kind of weird gravity it's called Vasiliev gravity, uh, and it's uh, hard, to, uh, hard, hard to work with. So it's, uh, these are models which are simple to solve. They are very close to free theory, but their gravity duals are difficult to solve. Um, in some intermediate range, we have SYK. So that's the intermediate blackboard. That will be what we'll discuss. Um, and um, then, uh, the, then we have the models that are dual to Einstein gravity, such as uh, planar gauge theories or Larsen gauge theories. 
uh, large hand matrix models where we have uh, fields whose, uh, that have two indices. So large hand gauge theories are an example uh, that transform under UN. Um, and um, in these models, we uh, have, anom so in SYK, we'll end up having anomalous dimensions which are of order one, and they don't have a known gravity dual. But in this case, uh, if the Toft coupling that uh, Douglas introduced, so G square N, is much bigger than one, and of course also N is much bigger than one, in this case we have Einstein gravity duals. So these models are a little more difficult to solve because especially in this regime, uh, it's hard to sum all the planar diagrams. So there is a, only a subset of diagrams that contributes planar diagrams, but it's hard to sum them up. Um, so for that reason, they are harder to solve. In some special theories, like n equal to four super young mills, you can use some very special uh, integrability techniques to, to do those sums. Okay, so enough of an introduction. So now we'll uh, start uh, discussing aspects of the SYK model. So first, uh, we start with the Hilbert space of the model. So a Hilbert space is a finite dimensional Hilbert space that is uh, generated by uh, n Majorana fermions, uh, i from 1 to n. Uh, so these are anti-commuting operators. Um, um, and psi dagger is equal to psi, uh, and they are fermions. Uh, so you should have a minus 1 to the f uh, operator in the theory also. And for these reasons, we really should restrict n to be even. Uh, in order to have a reasonable Hilbert space. Um, I mean, and um, then uh, the dimension of the Hilbert space, so the dimension of the Hilbert space generated by this is finite, and it's uh, 2 to the n over 2. So um, this uh, n Mariana fermions, so if you take a pair of Mariana fermions, they form essentially one qubit, and uh, from all those uh, and n over two of those uh, qubits generate the full Hilbert space, and that's uh, the total dimension. And if you wanted to realize a uh, model based on this Hilbert space in the computer, you can realize these operators as essentially gamma matrices. So you have the usual construction of gamma matrices in, the, in terms of Pauli matrices, sometimes called the Jor jordan Wigner uh, construction. And from there, you can uh, represent these uh, operators on a computer and then do a bunch of calculations. Yes? Why don't you stop with those uh, Pauli matrices? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, you, you could. And then you would have models that involve qubits. Um, but we are going to write uh, a model in which the Hamiltonian um, is simple in terms of these fermions. So it involves a small number of fermions. Um, as I'm going to write it down, and if we wrote it in terms of Pauli matrices, uh, it will involve uh, many fermions because each of the, each of these, yeah, let me first write down the Hamiltonian and then finish answering your question. So the Hamiltonian that we are going to consider is a Hamiltonian uh, where we have some couplings, um, i, j, k, l, psi, i, psi, j, psi, k, psi, l. So the important point here is that we have this, uh, it involves only four fermions at the time. So in some sense, it's k-local in the sense of uh, k-locality that was discussed before. Uh, but it's only k-local in terms of the fermions. So if we wrote it in terms of the Pauli matrices, since each fermion has a whole string of Pauli matrices, we'll get more Pauli matrices. Um, and OK, so this, uh, these couplings, uh, the idea is that they are random. Uh, random couplings. And they are Gaussianly distributed. So they are taken from a Gaussian distribution, which uh, is the same for each of the values of the indices. Um, here, um, we really consider only um, anti-symmetric combinations. And uh, so here, all these indices are anti-symmetrized. Um, and this is normalized so that um, we have one uh, dimension full constant that we will call j. And then we introduce a factor of n uh, to simplify the large n counting. So this is n cubed. And um, yeah, so this is uh, 
written with some foresight of the thinking about the kinds of uh, diagrams that will contribute. So in the large and limit, we are going to keep uh, this constant j finite. And with the scaling, the model has a simple, well, the, the, the has some interacting limit where uh, we can keep j constant. Uh, j has uh, dimensions of energy, and um, in this model, we, uh, in the ultraviolet, or at very short distances, uh, basically nothing happens. The Hamiltonian hasn't have, uh, have had any time to act. But then as we go to long distances, the Hamiltonian has time to act and creates, uh, well, creates complications, creates a complicated state. Right? So it's a model which you can call uh, free or even topological in ultraviolet, uh, but then becomes uh, non-trivial in the infrared. And our goal is to understand uh, those uh, non-trivial features that uh, the model develops as we uh, go to the infrared. And so there are various uh, generalizations. One simple generalization is to replace, uh, instead of considering interactions of four fermions at a time, we could consider Q fermions at a time. Um, and people consider such variations because uh, it's sometimes simpler to solve and so on. But we'll, for, the, for the moment, I'll stick with this one um, and discuss uh, later other versions. Um, OK. So now, suppose that you pick those couplings uh, that we discussed over there. And uh, you, let's say you have uh, some energy. So these are the possible energies that the model can have. Then um, it's uh, clear that since the Hilbert space is finite, the possible range of energies, of energy eigenvalues that we'll have, will also be finite. Right? So we'll have some uh, finite number of energy eigenvalues, which come from diagonalizing that Hamiltonian. Um, and we can do a little plot of the eigenvalue density, of how many eigenvalues are for given energy. Of course, uh, here we have some discrete eigenvalues, but we can do a little bit of coarse graining and draw a kind of histogram of the number of eigenvalues for given energies. Since the j's are random, and we could have chosen j, uh, go, we can, at least statistically, we have a symmetry of j goes to minus j, we expect the spectrum to be at least statistically uh, reflection symmetric around e equal to zero. Um, and indeed, that's uh, what one finds. So one finds some kind of spectrum that, uh, let's say, has some shape. If I can draw it right, it should be, uh, it should look the same on both sides. It doesn't, sorry. That's, uh, you do a little bit of error correction. And so it's statistically symmetric. And it turns out, and we, we'll show that later, but uh, so this goes to min minus some number times n times j. Uh, and then this is plus the same number. Uh, so it has here a spread of order n uh, when we keep j fixed. And we have lots of uh, energy levels here. Here we should uh, fit an exponential number of levels uh, within this graph. That means that if we look at, uh, for example, the low energy, as we will be doing later, we'll look at the low energy spectrum. Uh, we'll um, be choosing times. So suppose we choose times uh, or temperatures such that t times j uh, is uh, of order one, but uh, well, if if, uh, if the times and betas are very sm much more than one, we are in the free regime. So basically, all of them contribute. But when they become much bigger than one, um, then uh, but much smaller than uh, n or some power of n, uh, then we still have uh, some large number of levels that contribute. If we take, uh, for example, a temperature which is uh, an inverse temperature which is or a temperature that is so small that is exponentially small in n, so it's e to the minus n, then the only state that will contribute will be the last state, the ground state. Okay? We are not going to go into that regime uh, through these lectures. We're going to be interested in regimes where uh, an exponentially large number of states are contributing to the dynamics. So we are not going to consider such long times. Now, it turns out that uh, in these regimes, um, when we consider the model at leading orders in the 1 over n expansion, we can treat the disorder as an extra field. So in principle, we are supposed to fix the disorder once and for So what we are supposed to do in principle is to fix the disorder once and for all, and then uh, calculate correlators in the model. Okay? 
That's uh, what we are supposed to do. And then we might take uh, the average of those correlators with respect to the disorder. So that's the proper way to think about these disorder systems. But it turns out that uh, this system uh, is sort of self-averaging, so that um, since there are so many Js, uh, the, um, already within the model, there are so many Js that they average out, and the behavior just for a single realization of the disorder is very similar to the behavior, for example, of the partition function when we average over disorders. Um, OK, so now uh, I would like to show you how to uh, get the leading approximation to this model. And we'll do that from a functional integral point of view. Uh, we could also do it by analyzing the leading order Feynman diagrams that contribute. And uh, maybe we'll mention that a little later. But we'll instead derive this uh, from a functional integral argument. So uh, we have a functional integral that we are interested in doing, which uh, has the form um, integral uh, over the fermions. So we can think of these fermions as uh, one-dimensional fields. Uh, just to fix ideas, you can think that uh, t represents uh, Euclidean time. And, but you could also, same argument works for Lorentzian time. Um, so we have a kinetic term for the, um, for the fermions. Um, so this is uh, this kinetic term. What it does, it simply reproduces, will be such that it reproduces the commutation relations that we had over there. And then we have the interaction term, sort of, uh, I guess I was calling it capital J, um, M R S Q, uh, psi M, psi R, psi S, psi Q, okay? Four fermions. Um, so that's uh, our original model. Uh, but, uh, as I said, we will uh, treat the disorder as an extra field that is independent of time, and we'll also integrate uh, over all the couplings, all the Js, uh, with a Gaussian weight. So with a weight uh, which is uh, such that it reproduces the, um, what we had there for the Gaussian distribution. So this is MRSQ squared times um, N cubed over J squared, right? And then here we sum over all the indices. So that's uh, what we're going to do. As I said, this is, this is uh, correct to lead in order in the, uh, in the large N expansion. Um, uh, the, a, a more correct way to do things would be to take this, uh, partition, take this partition function, in, in, take um, this partition function with some sources and then uh, divide by the partition function without sources and then average. And that would reproduce the, and then, the, and then after you divide, you average, then that would reproduce the free energy. Um, now, so we, we take this and now what we do is we, uh, we, when we average over the disorder, so when we integrate out the disorder, uh, we, can, um, we can complete this uh, Gaussian integral and we get uh, an integral that um, will contain eight powers of the psi. So we'll get, so let's say we already integrated over this disorder. Uh, we just get an integral only on psi. We get the kinetic term that we already had here. So this, uh, this term is the same. And this term becomes uh, a double integral over t and t prime of um, something which uh, has the form psi L of t, psi L of t prime over, uh, over n. So it's the average uh, to the fourth power times uh, j squared times n. So there is an n to the fourth here. And with an n, this gives an n cubed, which is the same as the n cubed we had over there. Okay. So that's what we get. Um, so after we do this, uh, we, um, we insert one. Um, so this is uh, the one that we insert. We will insert that one in the functional integral. So one is the integral over dg, where g is a function that depends on two times, on t1 and t, t, t and t prime. Um, and um, we just have a delta function of g minus uh, this fermion bilinear. So the objective of introducing this one will be to replace that, uh, that term that involves uh, many fermions with 
uh, just something that will look like uh, g to the fourth over there. So that's uh, the objective of doing this. And uh, so this is just one. And then we further rewrite this one as the, the, we rewrite the delta function as a Fourier transform uh, in, in the Fourier, in the, in Fourier space, um, where if we integrate this sigma along the imaginary axis, we get uh, the delta function. Okay? We get the product of delta functions for each pair of points, t and t prime. So that's uh, what we are doing here. Um, and then uh, we go back to the, the original Lagrangian. So we had uh, this term. That's the same term we had in the original Lagrangian. Um, then uh, we have this term that comes from the delta function here, from the one that we inserted. Uh, we have also this term that we, uh, we, we comes from the one that we inserted. And uh, finally, we have uh, this term g to the fourth that comes from uh, replacing that product of fermions, uh, that fermion two-point function, uh, by, uh, by this. So g, once uh, you see that what this does is it fixes the uh, g to be equal. So if you wish as an operator, it sets it to be equal to this product of fermions. That's what the delta function does. And so when we eventually solve the theory, the interpretation of g will be that of the two-point function of the uh, two fermions. So we can co this, um, if we wanted to compute correlation functions of uh, fermion two-point functions, so we can have, let's say, a four-point function or a six-point function where we insert fermions, we can reproduce those by inserting uh, these Gs. Um, very good. Um, so that's, uh, that's, well, that's what, where we got so far. But now uh, we notice that uh, this size are appearing quadratically in the action. And then we can integrate, uh, we can integrate the size. So the, we can integrate the fermions and get an action which uh, involves only g and sigma. And here it is. So integrating out the fermions uh, gives a determinant, or more precisely a fafian, because they are, uh, they are real. And so we have n fermions. We have a factor of n, uh, n times the fafian for one fermion. Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the terms that we get from the fermions. And then we have all these other terms, well, these other two terms that we already had in the previous step. These are uh, integrated over these two times. And well, all the functions here are functions of the two times. OK. Um, now, I'd like to now make some comments about this. So the first comment is that um, maybe I should write down the comments here. The first comment is that uh, n, which was the number of fields in the original model, now becomes a parameter of this action. So what we've done is we replace the functional integral over n fermions, over n, n variables, which are functions of time, by uh, something that involves uh, only a small number of variables, independent of n. So g and sigma are the uh, variables we're integrating over. And we have n appearing as a parameter, or uh, as a 1 over h bar of this action. So we can think of this as, a, as an action for g and sigma. We're doing a functional integral, and we have this as the h bar. Now, um, uh, second is that um, the, if we, because n is large, the leading approximation to this action will be given by solving the classical equations. We'll discuss the classical equations in more detail later. But uh, the point is that this functional integral will be simple to do at leading order, because to leading order, there is no functional integral to do. We just have, have to solve the classical equations that come from this action. Yes? Um, uh, the key, the key, yeah, so you should think of this as an operator. Uh, yeah, you should think of this as a matrix um, that acts on functions of one time, OK? So um, the functions of one time are the size that we originally had, the fermions. And so uh, more precisely, this should be viewed as dt, delta of t1, t2, 
times uh, d, let's say, of t2 minus uh, sigma of uh, t1, t2, OK? This is the matrix whose uh, Fafian we're computing. So it acts as on functions of one time. So if you wish, we could uh, discretize those functions and put the finite number of times. Um, and then this becomes a difference. And you could, uh, in principle, calculate it. And in fact, when you, yeah. Yes? So this self-averaging property, is it true if we are at finite n, or is it true if we are at large n? No, it's, it's only true uh, at large n. So if you consider other, other quantities, um, like uh, some very long time. For example, if we consider the same correlators, the same two-point functions, but at very long times, uh, the correlators uh, will see, well, they decay, and then they have some oscillations. And those oscillations are different for each realization of the disorder. They, are, they reflect the precise energy spectrum that we have in the theory. So when we go to lower, yeah, maybe I should say it better in the following way. If we look at some observable that depends on the precise energies of the model, or are somehow sensitive to the precise energies, then um, this self-averaging property will certainly not be true. Um, now, it turns out that, well, that, that is definitely not true. I mean, the oscillations, for example, are definitely uh, very different for each case. Um, if we uh, look just purely in 1 over n perturbation theory, the first uh, correction you get is goes like 1 over n to the, to the 3 in this case. Um, so it's at relative order 1 over n to the 3 that you start seeing some differences. Yes. Um, well, if, if we were doing the original functional integral, right? So that in going from the top of the blackboard to the bottom of the blackboard, I didn't assume large n. This is exact for any, so it's an exact rewriting of the partition function. I used large n to write the first formula, because the first formula used uh, the, um, the fact that disorder average, that's not the proper way to treat disorder, and there is some approximation there. But if we were computing the if we were computing the average over disorder of the partition function, then this is an exact rewriting, right? So that, that would so it, so this would be correct for computing the average of the partition function over disorder, right? Then it's uh, exactly correct. Yes. Okay. So the, the question was. Uh, what would be the difference if we treat the disorder as a quantum field? So here, so quantum fields are things that depend on time. So here, uh, we assume that disorder was independent of time, and that had an important consequence, which was that when we, uh, when we integrated it out, we got this function of two times. So the fact that we have here functions of two times is uh, directly related to the fact that disorder was, um, was independent of time. Uh, yeah. Um, any other questions? So you are saying if we use more n, then the first step uh, average over an example is not correct? Well, maybe, maybe I'll say it different. I think I said it in a confusing way. If what we are computing is the partition function for a given realization of disorder, and then we average over disorder, right? Then this derivation is exact. Yeah. Right? Now, um, yeah, so that maybe I'll just leave it there. Is it? Yes, yes, you, you should pick uh, appropriate contours. I mean, this, um, for example, there is a minus here. There is another minus here. So this, if you integrate over some real contour, you'll have some trouble. So you have to pick the appropriate contours. Yeah. Which, which is not self-averaging? Yes, yes. That, that's why I insisted it was the partition function. So if you want to calculate the, partition, the correlation functions, then uh, you have to do something slightly more complicated. And that's where large hand comes in. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this, this, I think these this details about disorder are not important for leading order in N. So for leading order, when we talk about the classical action, and even the one of rank corrections to the classical action, they will not be important. So, uh, and uh, for, so for most of what we will say, uh, those, those things are not important. Um, 
Now, if we had uh, th this type of uh, rewriting of the action is sim is can also be done for ON vector models. And the story is very similar. Uh, but the difference is that uh, for ON vector models, one uh, usually rewrites the action introducing either Lagrange, Lagrange multipliers or some extra fields, which are functions of time. And when we integrate them out, uh, we get um, we get that these are uh, functions of only one time, not two times. So that's the, the only difference, basically. And this discussion can be generalized to other dimensions. So you could do this uh, in uh, two-dimensional field theories with fermions, with bosons, um, and so on. And the difference is that instead of uh, having integrals over two times, we will have here integrals over the two space d-dimensional coordinates. Um, and uh, the functions g and sigma will be functions of those d-dimensional coordinates. So it's a function of a pair of points, um, um, which are the arguments of a two-point function. Um, so there are a bunch of other generalizations. You can do lattice models and so on, and they might be interesting for transport uh, questions in condensed matter applications. That was the original motivation of uh, Sash, Dev, and Ye. Um, and finally, I should say that um, there are also versions of this model without disorder. They are called uh, tensor models. They were introduced by Gurau and then uh, reinterpreted in this context by Witten. And uh, in those models, you have uh, also, you could have quartic interactions with fermions that have uh, several indices contracted in some intricate way, in such a way that to lead in order in the one over n expansion, the story coincides with what I'm talking about here. At some leading orders, the story becomes different. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes, thank you. Oh, well, at least uh, we are. Thank you. Um, I was so focused on the end that I forgot the symbol, yeah. Um, OK, so now we, uh, we can consider the equations, the classical equations. I, I promised uh, we would look at the classical equations. And the, first, we take the variation with respect to sigma. And as, uh, when we take the variation with respect to sigma, uh, we get here something that looks uh, schematically like uh, 1 over dt minus sigma equal to g. Um, so this, this expression is a bit schematic. We should think of this as a matrix, same matrix we were talking about here, and is equal to this other matrix. Um, and then that's one equation. And the other equation is uh, sigma equal to j square g cubed. So that comes from the, the equation with, res to, re with respect to g by taking the derivative of these two terms. So this equation is uh, simple in position space, so this is uh, yeah, so for the sake of this argument, let's say that uh, this is a function of uh, t the difference, the time difference, t12 or t1 minus t2. Um, so we could be considering a configuration. For example, we could be doing this in Euclidean time, and then we have time translation on the circle, and then we'll have functions of the difference of the two times. Um, and then this term can be uh, Fourier transformed and becomes a bit simpler in terms of in Fourier space. We have something like i omega minus sigma of omega, and this now is an ordinary function, which should be equal to g of omega, OK? So uh, if uh, you write them in terms of t12, uh, these are uh, relatively simple explicit equations. Um, and the only subtlety is that this is in position space and this is in Fourier space. So if you want to solve them, you need to, for example, if you, you might want to solve them by iteration. You start with the case with j equal to 0, and then you um, you calculate uh, sigma from here, replace it there, and try to find g to the next order, and so on. And, and you can do that. So you can, uh, you can solve the equations in this way. Uh, or you can uh, treat them as a matrix and really invert this matrix. It's more or less the same, the same thing. Um, so what do you get when you do that? Uh, I'm only going to discuss now the um, I'm going to discuss now the Euclidean case. Um, so we have uh, Euclidean time. So this is Euclidean time. Goes from 0 to beta. Uh, 
And this time is really the time difference, t1 minus t2, in the correlator. So we're going to plot g. Um, uh, the first point is that um, the, when G, when, yeah, maybe I won't say this in a lot of detail. Maybe, maybe you can believe me that um, for coincident times, the commutation relation does, fixes the actual value of G, okay? So in order to get the right commutators, you need to um, have a particular discontinuity in uh, G at uh, when T1 is equal to T2, uh, and this continuity should be one. Uh, and so uh, if this is zero, uh, so it should be one half. Uh, um, and then so the free propagator is essentially constant. Um, that's just simply the fact that the Hamiltonian is zero. So if you evolve by the Hamiltonian, which is zero, you should have a constant propagator. And that, that half is just determined from the commutation relations. Then when you start uh, including interactions, uh, it gets slightly below zero and so on. And then it, uh, it becomes smaller and smaller, and this is the behavior for very large, uh, for beta j. So this is beta j much bigger than one. Uh, this here is beta j um, smaller, much more than one, okay? So that's uh, more or less how it looks like. Um, and I will discuss now uh, an approximation. So this is the solution of the large hand uh, equations, so if you solve them numerically, you will find a sequence of curves uh, for each value of beta j, you will find the curve. Okay. Um, the problem after beta. Uh, how, how does it go after beta? Yeah, so the, the correlators are, um, are, correlators of a fermion are anti-periodic in uh, Euclidean time, and this might look a little confusing because uh, here they look periodic. But the, the, really, the correlator really physically has a discontinuity of one. Uh, of, so, so basically it goes to here, it's a half, then when we continue to the other side, it's a minus a half, but then there is this continuity that we were discussing due to the commutation relations, and which makes it completely periodic. So this, this, this plot, which looks completely periodic for a fermion, is really reflecting its continuity at uh, t, t equal to zero. Um, maybe that was a little confusing, but what? This is Euclidean time. So this is Euclidean time. Now, if you had an analytic expression, you could analytically continue to Lorentzian time. But if you're doing it numerically, you will have to uh, really uh, do a numerical calculation that would be appropriate to uh, Lorentzian time. So uh, you can also do that. Um, <coughs> Um, okay, so now what we're, I'm going to discuss is some low temperature analysis of this, uh, in this region. We're going to see that we are going to recover this, uh, this propagator from some uh, analytic approximation that is described by these dotted curves that is basically valid uh, in most of the region, except at very short times. Uh, we'll have some discrepancy, but for most of the region, it will be well described. Uh, by some, we, we will, the answer will be well described by some analytic approximation as we will uh, discuss right now. So we have uh, those two equations and now the objective will be to solve uh, those equations at low energies. And here is where you will see the simplicity of this model. Um, we'll find that at low energies we can solve those equations uh, analytically. So we can find the infrared fixed point of this, of this system. And we are going to do that by assuming an ansatz for the correlators and then checking that the ansatz is correct. So we're going to do this computation at low energy, so in the regime that I briefly uh, pointed out before. So t times j or beta times j are much, much bigger than one, but parametrically smaller than n. Okay, so that's the regime in which this discussion will apply. Yes. Well, the, 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 the propagate, so I discussed this functional integral derivation, and well, locally, uh, so this, this derivation is somehow locally correct, 
Uh, now, depending on the initial conditions or boundary conditions or exactly what you do, you might or might not have uh, dependence on T1 minus T2, uh, T1 plus T2. So um, if you are doing it the thermal ensemble, then uh, we have translate the boundary conditions are time translation invariant, and the solution also will have the time translation symmetry, and then it will be a function of only T1 minus T2. Um, so we'll, we'll keep with this assumption. And I think for the whole set of lectures, for most of the, well, we'll departure in, in, a, in a moment. But um, first we're going to uh, consider uh, times which are very small compared to beta, okay, compared to the temperature. And so uh, we're going to assume a scaling ansatz uh, for G. So we're going to say that G is one over T to the two delta, okay? So something that looks like uh, the correlation, scaling correlator similar to the ones we have in a scale invariant theory. Um, so, and now uh, we're going to just uh, sh solve those equations that we had over there. Um, so we're going to do that as follows. So first uh, we fo Fourier transform this. So the Fourier transform, I'm not going to keep the overall constant. Uh, one can keep it, but we're not going to do that. Um, and so the Fourier transform um, um, is uh, going to be uh, omega to the two delta, so it's the opposite uh, power, uh, minus one, because we had a time integral to do, um, to go to Fourier, Fourier space. Then from here we can calculate sigma, which is uh, like g cubed, and that we go like one over tau to the two times three times delta, okay? And then we can calculate uh, the Fourier transform of uh, sigma, and then this will go like omega to the two times three times delta minus one, okay? So here, uh, in this step, we used uh, uh, the second equation, and now we impose the first equation. Uh, and in the first equation, uh, we're going to impose it dropping the term that has i omega. So we're going to write it like i omega minus sigma times uh, g equal to one. And first we're going to drop this, and then we'll check that dropping this was correct, okay? Um, so if we do that, then we are saying that g of omega times, uh, times sigma of omega should be minus one, should be a constant, should be in particular independent of omega. So this times that should be independent of omega. And that implies that uh, two times four times delta minus two should be zero, okay? Uh, I just multiply, I'm adding the two exponents. And this implies that delta should be equal to one quarter, okay? So if you wish, we computed the anomalous dimensions of uh, the fermions in the infrared theory, right? In the UV theory, they had dimension zero. In the infrared, they have dimension one quarter. Now you should compare the length of this derivation to the length of computing the anomalous dimensions in n equal to four super young males. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, of course, in n equal to four, you get that the, the non-trivial ones are much bigger than one. Here you got them that they are further one, so. Uh, that's why. Um, now, you can check that uh, once you computed this, you can compute uh, sigma of omega, and you can compare you, that uh, goes like this. You can put one quarter here and check that the power of omega there is such that for small omega, it was correct to neglect that. That's exercise. Um, um, okay. Now, there is one, uh, one thing we notice here. So the, the equations um, have these scale invariant solutions, and they develop, uh, actually, the equations, if you neglect uh, omega, uh, they develop a scaling symmetry. And we, used, we really used it to, to solve the equations here. Um, and now, in higher dimensions, if you have a system that has scale invariance, typically also has conformal invariance, right? And um, in, uh, in just, when you have only one time dimension, it looks like uh, the conformal group should include all of uh, coordinate uh, transformations, right? So a rough argument would be saying, like, uh, scale symmetry tells us that the trace of the stress tensor is zero, and uh, in, uh, in one dimension, there is only one component to the stress of the stress tensor, um, namely just the Hamiltonian itself. 
So it's saying like the Hamiltonian is zero, and so we can do arbitrary time reparametrizations and nothing should change. Um, okay, so this is a vague argument, and we can just try to see whether it is true in this case or not. And uh, the answer is that it is true. This is a symmetry of the low energy equations. So um, if we take any solution that is uh, a function of two times that is a solution of the equations, then um, given any function which we interpret to be a reparametrization of time, so we reparametrize uh, time, then um, we can generate a reparametrized uh, solution, which is given by, uh, um, well, it's some new function of two times, which is given by f uh, prime of t, f prime of t prime uh, to the delta um, g of g. So the original solution, this is the original solution um, of f of t1, f of t2. So given any solution of the equation, we generate uh, another solution of the equation by doing this. And we define sigma in exactly the same way using the conformal dimension of sigma, which is three times the conformal dimension of g. Um, so if we do that replacement, then we can check that uh, that, uh, that is a symmetry of this equation. So it's very easy to check for this case, because the cube only uh, will, uh, I mean, this, this cube will appear because for sigma we have another factor of three and so it will work automatically, so that's trivial. Or you could say, well, we just define it so that this works. And then that one is a slightly more non-trivial, but you can also check that it works. Um, do you want me to show, well, no, maybe I will not. Well, maybe I'll, I'll say what the rudiments are for checking the second one. So for checking the second one, we can write it as, uh, as uh, sigma, sigma times uh, g equal to minus one, right? And it's convenient to write this equation in terms of the two times as uh, sigma uh, star g equal to a delta function. So uh, there are three times here. So this depends on two times. There is one time that is integrated over, and then there, is, there are two times here. And there are also two times here. There is the delta function of the two times. Um, and then uh, there is here an integral. Um, and then when we do the reparametrization, the integration variable changes by some f prime. And that f prime cancels against the factors of f prime to the delta and f prime to the three delta. And since four delta is equal to one, it uh, cancels out okay? and gives us. Uh, um, uh, this is a sketch. I mean, you, you can, as an exercise, you can go through this and check that indeed uh, it is, uh, it is, the equations are invariant. So this, so far we've checked that the equations are invariant. Uh, but uh, we can ask uh, where the solution we got was invariant. So we got the solution which was uh, t1 minus, well, g equal to, we got the solution which was g equal to 1 over t1 minus t2. And the question is whether this is invariant. So you can think uh, for a second whether this will be invariant or not. Um, yeah. So it uh, turns out that this is not invariant under a generic f. Um, it is invariant under a subset of the f's. So if uh, the function f is an SL to R transformation of time, then uh, this will be invariant. But if it is a generic transformation, then it is not invariant. So this, this uh, implies that uh, the way to think about this is that this symmetry, even though it's a symmetry of equations, it's uh, broken by, uh, by the solution. So the, the solution spontaneously breaks, uh, at least in the low energy theory, spontaneously breaks uh, that symmetry. Now this has a bunch of consequences. But before we discuss the consequences, uh, I want to um, well, so what we are saying is that uh, let's say we have Euclidean time so that the time is periodic. So we have the set of the isomorphisms of S1. Um, and this is uh, being broken spontaneously to diff S1 mod um, SL2. And this SL2 is the set of functions where we have 
So if we have two functions that differ by this, the action of this transformation, they are really giving rise to the same, uh, the same function, uh, g of t, t prime f. So if we start, uh, so what I'm saying is that if we start with this function, so if the original function we were discussing uh, over there is uh, this particular one, and then uh, we act uh, with, with f, we'll generate a new function, unless we have two f's that differ by this transformation, okay? Yes? Here? This? This is SL2R. This is divided by SL2R. Is that the numeric or the So this is, this is like the, yeah. Let, let me, uh, imagine you have um, a particle that moves on a sphere, right? And then uh, you set a position for this particle on the sphere. The original symmetry of the problem was SU2, right? But once you put the particle at some point on the sphere, you still have a U1 rotation symmetry around that point. So the manifold of po possible points for the particle is SU2 divided by U1. So SU2 was the original symmetry. U1 is the invariant uh, group, so the, the, the symmetry group that leaves the, the, that point invariant. Here, the full symmetry is the fermorphisms of S1, and uh, SL2, this type of transformations, uh, leave this uh, invariant, right? Is that clear? Yeah. 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 Um, does the reparameterization function have yeah. physical significance in terms of the Majorana term? Um, yes, it's a, um, yeah, it's, it's a reparameterization of the time of, well, we'll discuss a little bit more later, but, uh, the idea is that uh, you are reparameterizing the time uh, variable. Uh, it's a reparameterization of somehow the infrared time uh, variable. Um, yeah. No other questions? Um, of course, this, uh, this symmetry is, is broken in the original theory, so because once we add the i omega that we neglected, the symmetry is not really there, right? So if you're asking your question about the fermions, you want the fermions, um, you, you want to treat them exactly, then th this is not a symmetry of the problem. It's only a symmetry at low energies. Um, um, okay. Now, uh, before we discuss uh, more consequences, uh, well, we, there is one simple thing we could say is that uh, we could use uh, this reparameterization symmetry by, to generate an interesting solution. So we can uh, take the particular function f, uh, which is tangent um, of uh, pi tau over beta. Um, and if we choose this particular function, then we generate a g, uh, which is, um, proportional to one over uh, sine of uh, pi tau over beta, um, let's say beta to the two delta. Um, and this has the right properties. So this will be a solution because it's, a, it's an SL2 transformation. You, you might be a little worried that it blows up at some point, but uh, due to this uh, symmetry property, that uh, ends up not being a problem. And this uh, function, um, then th this procedure guarantees that this is also a symmetry of the low energy equations. Um, and, uh, and near, uh, for small tau, it goes back to the original, uh, the original function. And this is the function that we were plotting uh, down here. So the dotted line here is uh, that sine function. Um, that's the analytic solution that we promised, and it coincides with uh, the right, the solution of the numerical equations up to uh, times which are very small, which are of order one over j, right? So times of order one over j, this function, so if we continue to smaller times, this function blows up, but the correct function goes to one half. I, I haven't normalized it properly, so that's why I put the proportional sign. You, you can normalize it properly also. And, um, okay, and what can you do with this? So 
there is one uh, simple thing you can do with this solution, uh, which is to uh, replace it in the classical action that we've been discussing so far. So we discussed the classical action uh, that was written in the blackboard that now has been erased. Uh, we can replace it in that action. And in that way, we can compute the partition function of the model. Um, and we find that the log of the partition function, um, which uh, will have an overall factor of n, uh, remember the overall factor of n because it's the factor that was multiplying the classical action. Um, and then this, uh, if, you have, if you put in that sign, you'll get a diversion term uh, that uh, comes from integrating some of the terms of the action at uh, small time differences. Remember, there was an integral over two times, and there, when the two times are very close to each other, when you insert that correlator, you'll find uh, quadratic uh, diversions. Uh, we'll, we'll say what, well, the, let's first say what the meaning of this is. This divergence is cut off when the function starts differing from, so one function diverges, and that's why we got the divergence, but of course the whole model is finite, and in, in fact the correct function goes to a finite value, and that, uh, when you work out what that would give you, this would give you something of order beta times, uh, times j, okay, with some number here. And so this term uh, is uh, related to the ground state energy of the model, and that, recall when we talked about the spectrum of the model, we said there was some lowest energy, and that uh, lowest energy uh, is uh, given by this computation. So if you know, so that, it's not given by an analytic formula, it's just given by regularizing that and putting the correct answer. You can compute this number. From the analytic formula, you only derive that there is some number here that you can calculate. But there is one piece that you can calculate indeed, that uh, we can call it S0, and this S0 is just a constant, uh, and some, some number, and this has the interpretation, yeah, so what is the interpretation of this? So what's the interpretation of some term in the partition function that is simply a constant, right? the thermal partition function? Yeah, so that's the entropy. So that's the ground state entropy. So this is saying that this model uh, has some entropy at zero temperature. So you, you lower the temperature, and then you get some uh, ground state entropy. Now, this, if, if yeah. We to here, we don't yeah. Use, uh, choose a specific uh, F. Uh, yes. Would the solution match any part of that curve? Uh, no, no, well, no, the, you, you get this curve only if you take, well, if you take that F or any SL2R transform of that F, you get this curve. Oh, yes. So, yes. So why that F is special? Uh, that F is special because that F uh, is such that it obeys the, the resulting configuration or based the boundary conditions we want for the thermal circle. Oh. This is one, one way in which we can explain how to get the thermal answer. If you wish, we, we could have directly said that, well, this is the thermal answer. Uh, well, just okay, so for example, mm -hmm. we choose F to cube or some other something. We're also obeying the same boundary. Yes, yes, so if you, if you chose, for example, a different Fs, uh -huh. uh, one of the first things you will notice is that it will depend on the two times. So it will not be time translation symmetric. This F is special because it leads to an answer which is time translation invariant. Um, so the general F will not have the, that property. You want um, the thermal thing, right? What? You want the thermal correlator. So yeah, that, this is, yeah I, I don't want to confuse you. So the, yeah. you, you can choose any F you want. You are free to choose some other F, and that will give you a new solution. Oh. Um, and this is a valid solution of the low energy equations. This particular F gave us an interesting solution, which was possible solution, which was time translation invariant. And it turns out that this is actually also the solution that is selected by the high energy theory. I'll, I'll, I'll try, let me try to explain this a little more. And if it is not clear uh, in a few pages, let's, uh, if it's not clear in 10 minutes, ask me again. Um, let, me, let me try to say a few words about the ground state entropy. So, um, um, so we saw that there was the density of states, rho of E, right? So the idea is that this density of states um, has some piece which is very, very large uh, of the form E to the n S zero. That's the ground state entropy. And then it has some piece that uh, here varies, most low, varies with E, 
in some way that, let's say, for very small e, is independent of n, for example. So that would be uh, what this is saying. Okay. So that this is consistent with the Gramsci de Turner chain. Let me let me be. You, you might ask, uh, how is this ground state entropy consistent with the picture we were drawing of the density of states, right? It seems not to be consistent because this goes to zero while that uh, function uh, you know, goes to some constant. Puzzle, this is a puzzle. The resolution of the puzzle is that um, the way you should think about this is that there is some overall constant which is very large, and then there is some function of e uh, that varies smoothly. Let's say, for example, square root of e minus e zero, let's say. This turns out to be the right behavior here, but at least uh, with sufficient uh, accuracy. Um, and so this is a non-trivial function, but it's of lower order in the one over n expansion. So the idea is that we would get this function to, when we expand these whole equations to the next order in the one over n expansion. Uh, or maybe, uh, well, this. Um, so in other words, having a ground state entropy does not imply that you have exact degeneracy. All that it implies is that um, you, have some, um, you have some very big overall factor in the density of states. Okay? Now you will hear some other lectures uh, later in the school, uh, especially by Atish Dabolkar, uh, where he will describe uh, some special supersymmetric black holes where you will actually have exact degeneracy. So that entropy that you compute in gravity will be related to an exact, uh, exact degeneracy, and there you will, get, you will have some delta function of states at the, the lowest energy. Okay. Um, and you can consider some SUSY variants of the SYK where this, this is true and so on. But I, I think one of the interesting, well, this we already kind of expected, but the SYK model get, gives us an explicit uh, example where you can have ground state energy without having, of course, the exact degeneracy. Um, okay, so now um, let me discuss a bit more the implications of the um, of this symmetry. Um, So imagine that we were doing that partition function computation, and we decided to go to the next order. In other words, we had this, um, we are doing this functional integral, dg uh, d sigma, and we have, we have some action, which uh, we have the classical solution, g, uh, let's say the conformal solution we discussed, and then we expand it to quadratic order. So we have some, let's say, s2, which is the, or let's call it i2, uh, times delta g, something of order delta g square. Of course, we also have delta sigma square and so on. So we'll have some terms in the action. Since this is a classical solution, when we expand, we'll have uh, the second order terms. Um, and if we were to integrate uh, this over g and sigma, uh, well, there will be a problem because uh, this i2 will have some zero modes. So there are some fluctuations around the solution, which are generated by the reparametrizations, uh, which, uh, for which the low energy action, um, which, which are, uh, yeah. If, if we first approximate the whole action as the low energy action, um, and then we expand around that, keeping only the terms in the action at low energies, we would have an exact uh, zero mode, and we'll get a divergence, a divergence from the Goldstone bosons of this uh, symmetry breaking. Um, the way you should uh, think about this is that there is the whole uh, space where you're integrating. This is a very high dimensional space of G and sigma. Um, so these are very direct, various directions in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space over which we are in doing the integral. Um, there, is, uh, there is one point here, which is the correct solution um, the correct exact solution of the large end theory, so not making the low energy approximation. There is, of course, some whole set of configurations that you have at low energies, so there is some low energy space. Um, and then uh, there is a whole uh, subspace here, which is uh, generated by, so that's what we call GF. So these are the Gs that we generate from the 
from the exact solution here by doing a reparametrization. Okay? And what we are saying is that we first approximate here the action as the low energy action. This is an exact, uh, well, uh, the, the action really develops a very shallow valley or exact zero energy valley uh, in the space of, uh, well, in configuration space. So, I mean, there are, of course, orthogonal directions where, um, where the valley rises, and uh, you could do this functional integral in the orthogonal approximations, and that can be done, and it can be done using conformal methods, and it's a nice story. I won't discuss it. Um, but uh, the loss would be a problem because you have to do the integral along the shallow valley. And in order to do the integral along the shallow valley, um, well, before we do that, let's say we can separate this integral as an integral over df, so over that shallow valley, and then the integral uh, of all the variables in the directions uh, orthogonal to the valley, okay? So these are the directions orthogonal to the valley, and this, uh, here we can use the conformal approximation, on, and all the result of this integral will be conformal invariant. But then uh, we are supposed to do the integral along the valley, and um, um, and here we can think of uh, the action. So let's say even after we integrate it over this, we can think of an effective action. Uh, well, let's say first uh, forget this integral. Uh, we can take the conformal solution and do uh, or the original solution and do a reparametrization. And if we make the Lagrangian approximation, this is independent of f. But we should remember that um, if we remember that. Um, the, this conformal symmetry is only an approximate symmetry, so somehow we reintroduce the fact that we made an approximation, uh, then you find that there will be some action, uh, some action for f. So there will be some action for f uh, that will come from the fact that the symmetry is also explicitly broken. So this symmetry that we are discussing is a symmetry of the low energy equations, but in the full Hamiltonian it's not a symmetry. It is explicitly broken by the original Hamiltonian, and uh, that will lead to an action for F. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, th this is not a gauge symmetry. So this, uh, time rep this, this reparametrization we are discussing is not a gauge symmetry. Um, but, well, it's part of the variables we are using to integrate, right? So when we act with an F, when we take the G conformal and we act with uh, an F, we generate another G, right? Which is a different G. Let me, th this is uh, more clearly represented here. So this whole plane represents the space over Gs we're integrating. They're all physically different. Well, I thought you were just calling What? No, I'm not, I'm not. So this, is, this line here is the space of zero mode. So this represents the, um, the directions parametrized by diff of S1 mod SL2, okay? This SL2 is indeed a gauge symmetry for this discussion, but uh, let, let's forget about this. This is just finite dimensional. Right now we're discussing the infinite dimensional space of Fs, okay? So this is the, this is the, the Goldstone boson manifold, and uh, it uh, has some high, very high co-dimension. I mean, it depends only on functions of one variable, as opposed to functions of two variables, and um, that's what this line here represents, right? Is that clear? To what? I still don't understand what OK. Is it clear to, uh, should I, if there are other people who have the same question, I'm happy to discuss it more. OK. Um, yeah, so these are, these, are, these are naively equal action configurations, but um, due to the fact that the original problem did not have the symmetry, we now don't have that. Uh, Something that is analogous to this is uh, the problem of, let's say, QCD with uh, fermion masses, which uh, are uh, small, uh, smaller than the chiral symmetry breaking scale. Uh, then uh, you can first uh, ignore the fermion masses and uh, think of the spontaneous uh, chiral symmetry breaking that gives you a manifold of pions. And uh, then you can, in that, in that space, you can reintroduce the fermion masses and you get some uh, true minimum, okay? And you don't have any Goldstone bosons. So here is the same story. In the end of the day, we don't have any Goldstone bosons. Um, these are Goldstone bosons uh, of the, um, 
these f's are Gaussian bosons of the of the Euclidean functional integral. Okay, they are not, I'm not saying that there will be a particle for each uh, for each mode of f. Um, uh, okay, so the final uh, story here is that uh, the, we can, in the end, we'll have to integrate over this uh, manifold of Gaussian bosons, and this integral will have the form of, well, there will be a constant term which we can pull out, which will be the n times s0 that we discussed, and then uh, there will be some action, some action for f that comes from the explicit breaking. And we need to figure out what uh, the action for f is. Um, now, the, um, here we saw when we were solving the equations that um, in the middle we got a pretty good uh, approximation to the solution, but at the end points uh, we didn't, okay? And in general we expect that the, this action that we are discussing will come from the region where the two times are very close to each other, okay? So that uh, the, the low energy approximation will be fine when the two times are far, but when the two times are very close, the approximation will not be correct, and that's where we will get our action from. And that suggests, uh, the, that, suggests that this action, uh, it's reasonable to think that this action could be local in time. So that the action, um, this action uh, should be equal to an integral over time of some Lagrangian that will depend on f, f prime, f double prime, etc. So that's what I mean by local action. Now, um, we should remember that this SL2 we have here, uh, as uh, we remarked before, is an exact uh, gauge symmetry. So those functions that differ by an SL2 transformation should lead to exactly the same action. Uh, this is not really a symmetry of the problem. This is just. Uh, a redundancy in our way of parameterizing this uh, manifold of Gaussian bosons. Okay, and so um, here uh, we expect that this should have exact uh, exact SL2 invariance, and so that fixes the so the simplest action with SL2 invariance that we could write down is uh, an action which is given by the so-called Schwarzian derivative f. Uh, Ft, and um, um, yeah, so this Schwarzian derivative this action is not in the lower limit. No, this is the this is in the lower energy limit, but it's including the breaking of the symmetry. So we'll uh, we'll see what. Uh, so f of t, uh, well, it's uh, the usual Schwarzian derivative, uh, f double prime over f prime prime minus one half f double prime f prime squared. So this particular linear combination is SL2 invariant, and is the term with lowest derivatives that has this property. Uh, no, yes. What? You had you had spontaneous symmetry. So by Yes, yes. So the, the, the G, the fact that G uh, was non-zero and had that specific form implies we had a spontaneous symmetry breaking. But this is additional explicit symmetry breaking. It's something that is appearing in the action. And when you take the low energy limit, that, that doesn't appear. Yes, well, well, ask me this question in two minutes. Okay. Um, now, this, this action is an integral over time. It has a number of time derivatives, which is uh, two, right? So this, there, is, uh, there are two derivatives here, one derivative in the denominator. There is one derivative, but the squares so are two derivatives. There is one time integral, so in total there are one time derivative. And so uh, for dimensional analysis, we want this to, um, to go like one over j, okay? One over the energy, okay? To cancel the time derivative that was in, in the numerator. Um, this action is coming, I mean, the, the fact that we get the non-zero action is already present in the classical theory. So this is just the, in the, the classical action for G and sigma um, was not invariant under this reparametrization, and so it's broken already by this classical action. So there should be an end here, yes. Um, and then, uh, then there is some co numerical coefficient which uh, we can compute from this argument. 
And for that, you need to do uh, numerical calculation and um, solving these uh, equations and fixing this parameter. And you can do that, and, and you can fix the parameter. But you get uh, most of this uh, structure just from basically the symmetries. Now, this might have uh, sounded to you like a somewhat hand waving argument, but you can uh, do a more direct analysis of the functional integral and check that uh, you get um, this, this structure. Well, could you repeat one more time why we expected the action to be local? I, I didn't yes. So the idea is that the action is local because the solution um, here is not correctly given. The, the exact solution is not correct. So in this example, let's say the, exa the exact solution is not correctly given at short short distances, so as short when the two times are close to each other. But it was correctly given uh, at uh, longer times. Um, also, the term in the action that was appearing was a term when the two times were equal. Remember, there was a delta function of the two times. So those are some reasons for thinking it would be uh, local. Uh, but higher orders in one over j? Yeah. Oh, no, in delta G over there. Yeah, so, um, well, I if people have gone to higher orders in delta G, if you consider the transverse fluctuations, um, Vladimir Rosenhaus uh, has computed this, and the so this, in this allowed him to compute the three-point functions, for example. So that's one thing you can, you can do, and he even found the whole structure of uh, higher high correlat correlators which is equivalent to going to higher orders, but he did that only in the orthogonal directions. Um, um, now, of course, uh, this action uh, includes, uh, so somehow all orders along the valley direction, right? Um, but then there are some further interactions with the rest that, yeah. Uh, the S can be regarded as those on both, right? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, like ordinary weighing functions mm -hmm. of the array to just get to the Schwarzschild? It seems like yes, yes, yes. Yes, that, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. We are taking that action oh, and expanding. Yeah, yeah. The, the only reason we have to do that is because the action is complicated. It involves a determinant and so on. And when I said numerical calculation, I didn't mean uh, taking the matrices and do an exact, what people call exact diagonalization. Oh. What I meant is solving the large n equations, solving the, uh, uh, did I erase them? Yeah. Solving the large n equations that are the classical equations for this action. So that, that, that's what we're doing. So solving, we're doing just the standard thing, except that the action is complicated. Yeah. It's a bit like uh, the string field theory action, right? It's very complicated. So to, to do any calculation, you need to do some numerics and so on. Uh, this is much simpler, but still, yeah. Yes, yes, so this sl 2 symmetry is a gauge symmetry, so it uh, has to be preserved by everything. Uh, no, notice, by the way, that this is a higher derivative action, right? And if we went to Lorentzian time, we would get this, and we'll have more than two time derivatives. Um, well, uh, we have like four time derivatives in the action, and normally this, this kind of actions will lead to ghosts, and the reason these are not a problem is because we uh, have this SL2 gauge symmetry, so they, that, that gauge symmetry removes the ghosts. Um, ah, okay, I think I'm running out of time. Or maybe I already run out of time. Let me ask the organizer whether he can give me more time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one, one, one little thing we're going to say and then maybe we'll continue uh, next time. So, um, we, can, uh, we can take that action uh, you erased the Schwarzian action, unfortunately. Um, and we can put in now that solution, right? Uh, the solution for F that we discussed before, right? Because of the symmetry breaking, now the action will not be, uh, will not be, um, now because of that, the, uh, well, of course, there will be an extra term here in the action that comes from the Schwarzian action. And this will lead here to a term that goes like some constant in both that alpha that we discussed before and some uh, beta and j. So the one over j was the coefficient of the action. The beta comes from the derivatives we were discussing. Uh, so we get this extra term, 
And this extra term uh, leads to a new term in the entropy. So it's saying that the entropy has a term which is linear in the temperature. And um, so that the fact that this has a linear in temperature uh, near extremal entropy uh, follows, uh, is one of the consequences of this pattern of symmetry breaking uh, that we have in this model. So we have this reparameterization symmetry, which is both explicitly and spontaneously broken. And one physical consequence is the fact that the near extremal entropy goes like uh, the temperature. Okay. So that's one physical consequence. And uh, maybe next time, we'll discuss a few other ex uh, explicit consequences of that, of that symmetry pattern, sy symmetry breaking pattern. Thank you.